recently when I went to the bank, I'd taken a lot of coins and was depositing with my deposit. And I noticed that the uh, lady on the other end, she, the teller took each coin and she looked at it both sides and she stacked them up and she counted them out. And then after she had finished sh- examining every one and then stacking them up and counting everything out, she took them over and she weighed them. And she wanted to make sure that it was exact. You see, what she was doing was testing to see whether the coins that I was giving her were actually Hong Kong coins because you know what's funny? In our offering, we get all kinds of stuff. We get monies from all over the world. But at the same time, I mean, recently... Uh, Gladys came in my office and she was smiling and she said, these are two things we got in our offering today. One was a track and field medal and the other was a game token. So, you know, <laughs> I'm like, you know, people just grab the stuff out of their pocket and put it in. So the, the bank is sitting there wanting to make sure it's a Hong Kong coin. They're wanting to make sure that it's a valid coin and that it's it's stamped properly, and they're making sure that it's weighted correctly. In the Old Testament, New Testament days, when you went to pay for something, someone would be looking at your coin to make sure it was valid. They would weigh it to make sure it was the right weight. They would make sure everything was right. Today, when we're looking at this passage, I want you to understand that God says when we're hearing the message of a prophet. When we're hearing the message of a spirit, then we need to weigh it out the same way. We need to validate it. We need to make sure it's right. Now, the goal is to find the truth. And, and, you know, I don't think the bank teller was hoping that my coins weren't valid. She was hoping they were valid. And we're hoping that the message we're hearing is valid. But we are called to test it out. And here, John is in 1 John chapter 4. And remember, John's been talking about the false teachers in the church. And here he gives some tests on how we can validate them. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that can come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who does not, is not from God, does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay. Every spiritual thing that happens in our life has a spirit behind it. But that does not mean that spirit is a Christian-related, biblically-related, God-related spiritual experience. You and I need to understand that there is a battle going on. Paul would talk to the Corinthian church and say, Hey, there is a battle going on for your mind. And we need to understand there is that battle going on for our minds. And he tells us that we have powerful weapons at our disposal to make sure that the thoughts that are being used to try and direct us or guide us 
can be clearly discerned, clearly understood, clearly known. And that we are on a mission to destroy false beliefs, destroy false ideas, destroy the speculations that rise up against God. And we are called to take every thought captive in our mind that is correct and walk forward in them. He goes on later to talk to the Corinthian church and say, Hey, look, the spirits that are out there, the prophets that are out there, the false teachers that are out there, they disguise themselves as apostles of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to let them know, you realize Satan himself, think about that, Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. Wow. Look, you know, we see pictures of Satan. We see cartoons of Satan. We see cartoons of the evil forces and all that. And, you know, it's like the other day, Carol and I were driving down the road and we pulled up behind this van that was an art van and they were advertising art. And some of the figures on the, on the van were, were pretty rough looking, scary They were designed to be that way. I want to tell you what, Satan is not designing his approach to you to be scary. He isn't saying, get involved with this financial maneuver, get involved with this business, marry this person, walk with this life, and he's not making it look scary. He's making it look appealing. That's his goal. That's the goal of the false spirits. That's the goal of the false prophets. To make it look more appealing to walk outside of Christ than with Christ. So, as we look at this, it says test. Test whether it's real. Test whether it's different. (laughs) Every time I think about testing something for its difference, I think about people... And in one of my churches previously, I had a manager of a shoe company. And that shoe company made one shoe. That's all they made. One shoe. And they made that one shoe at that particular moment for 15 different brands. Now, he said it at at their... At different times, different brands would drop their shoe and another brand would pick up their shoe. So if you said, if if you go out and you look in the market, there's 30 different name brands that this shoe has been sold under since we've been making it. He said, I get tickled because people will be sitting there going, I bought my shoe from this company and it was a much better shoe, much higher quality than that one. And he's sitting there looking at them and they're the exact same shoe made by the exact same company sold by two different places at dramatically different prices. Wow. I want you to understand, we look at our world and we see multiple religions, multiple different ideas, multiple different viewpoints, multiple different thought processes, multiple different philosophies, and we think of them as multiple different things, unique sources. But John's trying to help us understand something. There are only two sources. There is God and Satan. Satan just brands his multiple brands. And so we need to be aware of that. So when we're thinking about it, let's test the spirits. Let's see whether they're valid. And I want to look at four tests that we can look at today when we test the spirits. When we're talking about the spirits, we're talking about the person. We're talking about their message. We're looking at who they are. Who, who are they? What are they? What are they saying? How does it measure up? The first test we want to have is what is their source of truth? Because everybody has a source of truth that they're coming from. They have a bent. They have a design that they've decided that they want. And you know what? To be frankly honest, in our world today, 
People would rather drive their life based on their own desires than facts or truth. I was reading a doctor's reporting last night, and he said, we have literally 300 studies that prove a particular thing causes cancer, yet the vast majority of people, even health magazines and different things like that, will say the opposite. Because that's the most popular, desirous position. Don't you understand? There is a truth. It's God's Word. That's where our truth comes from. The source of truth is the Bible. Not the Bible and a few other books. Not the Bible and something else. It is God's truth truth. This is it right here. We don't have to go anywhere else. You know, uh, we, we can talk about, you know, all the books we read and all the things we do. And, and I, I have friends and I, I read a lot of books and, and different things like that. But I, I think it's interesting. Ultimately, what drives us in the truth of God is studying his word, seeing what his word says about it and applying that to our lives. So we want to go to the source of truth, which is God's Word. So the teaching of this person, is it based out of the Word of God? Is it based off of the truth of Scripture? One study I read a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about this in staff meeting, was uh, uh, research in America that had shown among evangelicals in the United States that were surveyed, 74% believed that the Bible were true. Now, you know, that sounds great, but that, that's really disturbing to me. We're among evangelicals. H- how would you feel like if, if, if all of a sudden I said, 26% of the people sitting in this audience don't believe the Bible is true? H- how would you feel about that? You'd go, it's not me. Don't make me. Uh, but you may go inwardly, yeah, that, that is me. I don't really believe it's all true. Of Catholics surveyed, 47% said the Bible is true. Of other mainline Christian groups in the United States, 37% said the Bible is true. Listen, you and I need to come to a position of understanding that God's Word is truth. You don't agree with it. I don't always agree with everything it says in the sense that it challenges me. It points out errors in my life. I don't like it when I'm reading the Bible and God's sword of the Word comes in and cuts me apart. But that doesn't mean the Word's not true. It just means my life needs to change to meet what God's Word is. So you and I need to come to a place where we understand the Bible is true the truth that we need to base our message off of. The false prophets, the false teachers, any teacher. You see a TV preacher that you like, start checking his message in the Bible. You see my messages, if you like them, fine. But check it in the Bible. My message, any message, must line up with the truth of God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is inspired. That means God breathed. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. You see, it's God's Word. And if we accept the Bible as truth... It can become, as the psalmist says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's what we need. 
So we need to have God's Word, and we can test the Spirit. We can test the message. We can test everything by, is it God's Word? Is it backed by that? Does it, does it find its source there? The second thing is, we can test by, how is Jesus identified? What does this group, what does this person, what does this ministry say about Jesus? Because, see, that's key. Matter of fact, John very clearly says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Very clear. What do they say about Jesus? You know, as we look at our world today, there are so many different views on Jesus. <laughs> Jews think that Jesus wasn't divine. He was a, he's a respectable teacher, but definitely not divine. Buddhist, the, the Dalai Lama actually says Jesus' teachings are right up there with Buddha. He's actually equal to Buddha. Uh, the same as, but again, not, a, not God. Uh, Hindus say he's a holy man. He's a, he's a wise teacher. And he is a, a God. A God among many gods. Hundreds of thousands of gods. Baha'i will say many of the things that the Bible say about Jesus until they get to the resurrection. And they say there's no real way Jesus could be a resurrected being. So Jesus died, he went to the grave, he stayed dead. He wasn't resurrected. Jehovah's Witness say Jesus was a created being. He is not God. He was Michael the archangel who became flesh. Christian science say he was a man in tune with his divine consciousness. But again, not God. Mormons say Jesus was a created being. He is the brother of of Satan. He is the brother of us. <laughs> Islam says he's a created being, a prophet, but not God. What does the Bible say? The Bible says Jesus is the Christ. Remember? We talked about that. John talks about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He is Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He is the one that has come. He is the virgin-born Son of God. Islam says he was not virgin-born. He was born of natural birth. Others will say that same thing. He's a created being. Mormonism doesn't say it's a virgin birth. It doesn't need a virgin birth because Jesus is just a created being. You know, when we, when we look at this, He is a virgin-born Son of God. He is God who took on human flesh. When we talk about Jesus, He says, The Father and I are one. Wow. You see, the message needs to understand where do they come from on Jesus. Because they can look good. They can sound good. They can walk through the process. They can uh, 
As, as a pastor friend of mine was saying, he said, I'm, I'm talking with this man, and we talk about, do you believe the virgin birth? Yeah. Do you believe he's God in the flesh? Yeah. Do you believe this? Do you? Yeah. And it gets down to the resurrection. Do you believe he was born, that he was raised from the dead? No way. Then, folks, immediately you're talking about a different Jesus. Because in our understanding, in the biblical understanding, Jesus is God in the flesh, born of a virgin, the Savior, the only one. Jesus doesn't say, I'm one among many. Jesus says, no man comes to the Father except through me. So, John would point out that Jesus is the true light. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. When, you know, I was thinking this morning when I, when I read that. When did John see His glory? <laughs> Peter and John, James, on the, on the mountain. Wow, the glory of God settled down. This is my beloved Son whom I'm well pleased. Wow. John 1.29 says of John the Baptist, the next day he saw Jesus coming and said to them, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Savior. John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. You see, so... The, the group that he's talking with and one of, the, one of the fallacies of the false teachers that were living in his day would say Jesus was a spiritual being, not a physical being, but yet the Bible says he's both. And John understood as, as the Bible taught that truth is essential to our Christian belief. The third test, what's the subject of the message? You see, the, the world will substitute a lot of things for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, uh, when, you, when you look at what the substitutions are, I mean, what is the message? You can have hope in Christ if you are saved and then follow through with baptism and then keep up the certain rituals and, and make sure the right things happen and then eventually you will know you go to heaven. That's not in the Bible. That's in traditions of religion, but that's not in the Bible. Some people will say, you, you, would, you would, the gospel... In the Mormon church, the gospel is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of the Mormon church, their faith, their system. But yet they use the same terms we do. You know, it's funny. So, Mormons will talk about salvation. But they already believe in their system of beliefs that everybody is saved. There's no need for salvation. So when a Mormon and you talk about a conversation and you start talking about salvation in Jesus Christ and all of a sudden something starts happening, I want you to understand the message they're saying has the same words that you speak, but they don't come from the same definitions you come from. It's crazy. It's sort of like... One day when I was in uh, a conversation in Africa with one of my other missionary friends and we were talking and, and one of his friends was talking in another language and, and uh, I was a Nyanjan speaker and he was a, uh, a Bimba worker and, and I hear him say some things and I, I, I kind of smile and I think I know what he's just said. And John looks at me and he says, 
you don't know what he just said. It's the same words as your language, but it's totally different meanings than your language. One of the, one of the words I used to like, mañana, in Spanish means tomorrow. In Yanja means to beat violently with your fist. You know what? Here's what I want us to understand. The, the, the false prophets will use the same words, but the meaning behind them are completely different. Dig into the message. Just ask somebody, when you say salvation, what do you mean? When you say Jesus is the Christ, what do you mean? When you say something, tell me the background. You may go, oh, that gets too detailed. That, you know, I, I don't want to question somebody. The Bible says, here, test the spirits. Jesus told us to test the spirits. And when we look at it, the subject is very important. The Antichrist, that word anti in front of the Christ means to go against or it can mean instead of. You see, Satan, he just wants to replace Jesus. That's all. And any, any replacement of Jesus is against Jesus. And so we have the situation where Satan is opposed to Christ. He brings a substitute for Christ in the message. He doesn't deny a religion. Matter of fact, he uses religion as his chief instrument of opposition, as his chief instrument of suppression of people. Matter of fact, it is said that Sodom and Gomorrah were among the most religious cities of the world at the time that they were destroyed for their falseness. Their wrongness. I like what Adrian Rogers says. The Bible has one theme, salvation. One hero, Jesus. One villain, the devil. The Old Testament says someone is coming. The New Testament says someone has come. The book of Revelation says someone is coming again. The person is the Lord Jesus. He is the hero of the Bible. The hero of the message is Jesus. Salvation comes through Jesus. And we need to understand what God is teaching us. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, not but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Look, folks, in the Christian world, we can point out numerous places where people do this. They adopt other things than the gospel of salvation. They adopt other things than the biblical truth. It doesn't matter how popular an author is or a preacher is, how many people come to see his message, his message, if it is not Jesus, is not right. A very, a very popular American preacher recently was interviewed and asked if Jesus was the only way of salvation to which he says, I can't judge anybody. I don't think that that would be right. And I think that if someone's sincere about their faith, God will make allowances. He actually pastors the largest single church in the United States. That is not his first time to make that statement. He is a false prophet. Jesus says, I'm the only way. 
If I'm going to look and say, well, Jesus, you say the only way, but I'm going to say there's, a, there's some give and take here. Your, your love is a little bit different. Your, your wrath is a little different. I understand you a little different, and I'm going to allow you to be taught this way. That's false prophets. Look at the message. What is it saying? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, I, For I have determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11 say that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and when it says Jesus as Lord, that means Jesus is in control. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. And then the last test. What is the spirit of the messenger? Is the messenger's desire more to be in touch with the world or more to be in touch with God? Because again, the success of a minister, the success of his ministry, don't necessarily show God's approval. Because as we mentioned earlier, there are false spirits that are behind a lot of things and move in the wrong ways. Does the message of the messenger give the word to the people they want to hear? You know, in our world, we, we want people to feel like they're, uh, they're going to be healthy, they're going to be wealthy, they're going to be uh, powerful, they're going to be all these things. You never hear Jesus telling that to his disciples. Never. Matter of fact, Jesus says, I want you to be aware that the world hates me. And if you follow me, he's going to hate you also. I want you to be aware of the fact I don't have a house. I don't even have somewhere to lay my head. And if you follow me, there will be days you will possibly be just like that. And yet we live in a world where we, we, we want everything to be nice. What's the spirit of this messenger? Does he teach? one thing and live another thing. Jesus warned in Matthew 7, beware of false prophets in sheep clothing that are ravenous wolves. In the 24th chapter of Matthew, he talks about that there will be many false prophets that arise and mislead. In verse 24 of that, chapter, he also says, listen to this, false prophets will arise and will do great signs and wonders. Oh, but I saw somebody heal somebody. I saw somebody do something amazing. Jesus says there will be people who come that do those kinds of things that are not from God. Test their message. Test what they say about Jesus. Test their source of truth. Don't just accept everything right off. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, it says, For the grace of of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and live sensibly, righteously, 
and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know what? Instead of looking for a message that makes you and I feel good, we need to constantly go back to what Jesus is talking about. In the U.S., I could say it's, it's not the idea of you're going to a Tony Robbins motivational speech where he can hype you up and get you excited about something and then you can go out and, and with that energy do something for a little while and then need to come back and get reloaded. But folks, if it's not biblical, it has nothing to stand on. In Luke chapter 12, verse 29 through 31, it says, And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. Okay, you get that? They're seeking after the wealth. They're seeking after the health. They're seeking after provisions. They're seeking after everything there. Your father knows that you need these things. Trust him to take care of that. But seek first his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. As a believer in Jesus Christ, as our personal Lord and Savior, our goal is to seek out Christ. Seek out His wisdom. Seek out His direction. Allow Him to influence our decisions, influence our day. Be in contact with Him throughout the day. So that we're constantly talking with Him. He's never too busy to interact with you. He's never away from the phone. He never is inaccessible. Trust Him. Follow Him. Because Jesus Christ is the only hope we have. And He says, when we have Jesus, we have that which is greatest of all. Because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. Today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you may go, well, you know, I, I hear all these different messages. And my, my Jehovah's Witness friends are saying this. My Mormon friends are saying this. My Catholic friends are saying this. My uh, other other religious friends are saying these things. What, what do I find is the truth? Get in God's word and begin to ask the question, God, lead me to your truth. And I can guarantee you'll find it. Colleen Rawson was a seminary professor at Brigham Young University. She was at a conference in Los Angeles, California. And there were guys handing out brochures and as they were going up into the conference center, they would hand out a brochure. And it was two Christian guys that would just hand out a brochure that say, you say you believe the Bible, would you answer these 12 questions from the book of Romans? And she said most of the people would just throw them down because you may be aware that the, that the, the Mormons consider the Bible the most corrupted book they have. All right, most unreliable, most. But she said, you know, as a seminary professor, I thought, I say I do believe the Bible. She said at the time I had never read it. She said I went back to the hotel and I opened the hotel drawer and there was a Gideon Bible there. I pulled it out. I began to read the book of Romans and answer those questions. And she said it rocked my 
world. For the first time, I was exposed to the truth of God. And she said, as I sat there, I wept. And she said, over the next month, I lived in panic. And I was studying, and I was learning, and I was growing. And, I, and all of a sudden, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Of course, when she became a Christian, she no longer was allowed to teach at Brigham Young and had to leave. But you know what? God's truth will speak to you if you will read it and ask Him to speak to you. So this morning, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, read the Gospel of John. Read the book of Romans. Ask God, speak to me in this. Show me and see what he opens up. For those of us who are Christians, let's be good testers. Let's look at both sides of the coin. Let's count it out. Let's weigh it up. And let's see how the message and the messenger Stack against proper test. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and guidance today. We just ask that you lead us and direct us. Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to walk with you in a way that honors you. We want you to be glorified in and through our lives. And today, Lord, help us to be alert to the false prophets. But Lord, help us to not only be alert to them, but help us be focused on you. Because we know as we put our life in your hands, as we stay focused on you, many of the false statements will become very evident. Guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen.